We get hit with statements about the superiority of disc brakes all the time. Bike manufacturers say that discs are the future. A lot of bike riders, to be fair, say that discs are the future. And several GCN presenters, in fact, feel that discs may well be the future. But do we actually know why? We get told that discs give better braking performance, but then critics will say, well, you don't need better brakes on road bikes. You need better tires that give you more grip because you can lock up your wheels very easily with rim brakes, should you so wish. To those critics, I would then say, aha, it's not about power, it's about modulation. And then I realized I actually don't have any facts to back that up. It's all based on feel, and feel is, of course, completely subjective. So we wondered whether or not you can actually analyze the performance of disc brakes versus rim brakes, generate some real data, for both wet weather and dry to find out just whether discs are actually better at braking. So how are we going to do super science then? Well, firstly, the bikes. We've got two Orbea Orcas here, one with SRAM Red ETAP HRD disc brakes, and then one with SRAM Red mechanical rim brakes. Now, while the bikes aren't completely identical, the important points are, so the geometry of the frames is the same. My position on the two bikes is also the same. And then the contact patch, the tires are also the same. They're Continental GP 4002s, 25 mil wide, and run at the same pressures, so 75 PS. SI. And then what are we going to do with them? Well, we brought them to the Alta Badia region in the Dolomites and we are currently stood on top of the incredible Paso Pordoi. Down there in the background lies nine kilometers of sinuous tarmac, one of the most amazing descents I have ever ridden. And I'm going to get to ride it another four times, twice on each bike, once in the dry and then once again in the wet. Then in terms of the data we're going to collect, Firstly, we've got our GPS data that we're going to get on our Wahoo elements. That will be able to tell us, obviously, our actual time, but then also we'll be able to drill down and see specific entry and exit speeds on corners. Now, so far, that might not sound too sciencey, but we're going to back it up with power meter data. And we're in a heart rate monitor, although I'm not totally sure that's going to tell us anything. But then it's going to get really, really interesting with this which may well just be a phone, but it has an app on there that turns it into a really accurate accelerometer. So all being well, this will tell us just how hard I can brake on a disc bike versus a rim brake bike, and then also how hard I can lean into corners. See, science, big data. Right then, let's go. Uh, disc bike first, in the dry. Recording. Here we go. Here we go, run number two, rim brakes. I'm a bit more familiar with the descent, so that might go in their favour. Right, run number three, rain with a little bit of snow on discs. Ready, off we go. Oh God, the things we do for science. Right then, run number four, rim brakes in the wet.
Right then, time for some data. And there is quite a lot of it, actually. We logged 688,000 points of data alone from our accelerometer. So it's taken a little bit of time and more than a lot of help from GCN team legend and brain, Daffid Thomas. So thank you very much to him. Right then, the million dollar question. Were disc brakes faster? Yes. And also no. In the dry, there wasn't much to separate the two at all. And in fact, rim brakes came out slightly faster by two seconds, in fact. In the wet, though, the results were flipped. Disc brakes were significantly faster by eight seconds. And if you translate that out onto the road at 50 kilometers an hour, that works out as about 120 meters of gap between the two. So that's not to be sniffed at, I don't think. But that's just the top line. Let's have a closer look at the data, shall we? We do have enough of it after all. We've isolated a key section of road. It's 2.2 kilometers long. It's got 11 corners on it. Some of them are super fast and others really tight. If we overlay the speed of each bike through that section in the dry, then we can again see that there isn't much to separate the two. Disc brakes are in blue and rim brakes are in red. Now the GPS data is a little bit patchy in places, but if anything, it does look like the disc bike goes slightly faster on the straights, but then also slightly slower around the corners. The power data was the same. The average was 175 watts for each run, and the maxes were also about the same, 804 watts for discs and 811 watts for rim brakes. To see whether or not we really were going faster on the straights and slower on the corners, we've taken the velocity data and plotted it on a histogram. So that is where each bar represents the number of seconds on each run where the bike was going at a certain speed. So if the bike was consistently going faster speeds, we'd expect to see taller columns on the right hand side of that graph. And we can see that on that short twisty section, again, there isn't really anything to separate the two. But then if we look at the data over the whole run, we can actually see that the rim brake bike consistently hits much faster speeds. And that's kind of puzzling. So we thought about the bigger picture. And although the bikes are almost identical, you can actually guess that the rim brake bike has the aerodynamic advantage. If nothing else, it's got the slightly faster Zip 404 NSWs as opposed to 303s. So potentially then, a significant part of the faster velocities could actually be down to pure aerodynamics. What about in the wet then? Well again, disc brakes seem to go a little bit faster on the straights and then a little bit slower in the corners. But this time, when we actually plot that data on a histogram, we can actually see that that is indeed true. Disc brakes did seem to go a little bit faster on the straights. So that's food for thought and we will come back to that in just a moment after we've had a look at our acceleration data. Now I'm not going to lie, this was a massive pain in the backside. I was a little bit concerned initially that the data would simply be too noisy given that the top tube of a bike at 70 kilometers an hour is probably going to be quite bumpy. And sure enough, not to be deterred though, we took the data from the y-axis which records force in the direction of travel and then DAF set about looking into one particular corner with a super fast entry. Can we see the difference? Uh, one thing though, those oscillations at the end of the graph, they were the only pattern that was repeated throughout the whole of the descent and we could see it quite frequently. So we plotted that against GPS data and it turned out that that's actually me getting out of the saddle and sprinting back up to speed. Kind of cool. Not very relevant to braking, but nevertheless, kind of cool. Anyway, through the noise, I think you could argue that actually there is definitely more pronounced activity on the disc brake bike on the entry into the corner. It looks like I brake harder compared to the rim brake bike where there is less activity. Until midway through the corner when I grab a handful of brake, which is not exactly textbook stuff, I know. And then those big spikes, by the way, that's actually bumps in the road, like that one. So if that is a summary of the data then, what does it all really mean? Well. There isn't much to separate disc brakes and rim brakes when it comes to performance in the dry. There is nothing from any of our data sets, in fact, that can really set them apart other than perhaps our rim brake bike 
perform slightly better aerodynamically. In the wet though, things are much more interesting thanks to the fact that there is actually a difference between the two, particularly the faster top speeds on straights, which I think are probably down to the fact that the braking in the wet on disc brakes is much more controlled. We can see from our accelerometer data that I was able to brake much harder and therefore slow down faster. And given that I obviously didn't have any more grip from the tyres, I think that purely comes down to more predictable braking. Do that for each corner then and you can see where time is really going to add up. The reason I was going slow around the corners on the disc bike in the wet was probably a result of it being my first run down the mountain in the rain and therefore on the second run I was a bit more familiar with the level of grip that the road was offering. And actually the same was true in the dry, the disc bike went first and the rim brake bike went second. And although it wasn't my first run down the mountain full stop, I was a little bit more familiar with the road, particularly on a couple of key sections where I knew that I could let off the brakes completely. Now, in the intro to this video, I said that the only thing we ever really talk about in the disc brake debate is feel. And so having spent ages collecting data and then going through it, I do feel slightly sheepish about the fact that we are now gonna come back to feel. But then maybe actually that is one of the most important things when we ride our bikes. I had more confidence descending on a disc brake bike in the wet. And actually I had a little bit more confidence in the dry as well, if I'm being completely honest. And clearly I wasn't making the most of the bike, I wasn't pushing the tyres to their limits. And I think that comes down then to a limitation of the test. I didn't do enough runs to remove any kind of bias about run one versus run two and being more familiar with the road on that second run. So more time needed actually doing tests. And then whilst we're at it, why not do tests on different descents as well? That may well change the results, as would different riders. What happens if you weigh 60 kilos, as opposed to my 73 kilos? And then what happens if you're 80 kilos or even 90 kilos? It certainly brings home the difficulties with actually trying to measure the differences between bikes. Often what we perceive as being significant is actually almost impossible to quantify out on the road. Finally, before I go, there is one thing that definitely needs to be said, and that is that our little test track of the top five and a half kilometres of the descent of the Paso Porto and the Dolomites was one of the best descents I've ever ridden. And on each bike, regardless of brakes, it was fantastic fun. And I think that is very important to mention. Now, obviously, we want to hear your thoughts on this. Have we missed something from our data? And in fact, which side of the fence do you sit on in this great debate? Disc brakes versus rim brakes? Let us know in the comments section down below. Also, make sure you subscribe to GCN before leaving this video. It's very simple and free. Just click on the globe. And then if you want some more content now, we've got two old but very good videos about disc brakes. Are they ready for road bikes? That one is just there. And how much faster can you stop with disc brakes? That one is just there.